Hey there everybody and welcome to what really is the first <laughs> version of the Aerospace Guru podcast. I know I put together a introductory podcast or a little snippet there uh, a while back saying this would be the first of uh, many, possibly on a monthly basis, but uh, that didn't turn out to be quite the truth. A uh, number of things that came up that uh, required my attention, namely trying to set up my own business and getting it going uh, has been interesting. Um, I've gone down a, a very particular route that's required a lot of energy and a lot of time. Uh, combine that with the fact that the aerospace industry and aviation industry in particular has just gone down the toilet. Um, so yeah, I've had to just refocus myself into uh, efforts that will hopefully set me up well for the future. Anyway, never mind that. Um, this is another little short entry just to get everything going again. Um, I know I said I'd discuss things in particular that are of interest to the uh, infrastructure side of things in, in the uh, aerospace world. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that um, I'll get onto that now. Um, when I first put together the podcast there in, in the beginning of May, we had sort of just got into the beginning of the pandemic and people were kind of wondering what, what on earth was going on. How are we going to go through this? Some people were thinking that it was a temporary measure. Others were more uh, cautious about that and thinking it is more of a long-term uh, thing. Uh, it would appear the latter is going to become the, the normal scenario. Um, airlines are obviously getting into a position where they're trying to plan for a return to uh, normal, inverted commas, in about 2024, which is quite concerning, really, for... Uh, any of us who are involved in aviation and aerospace infrastructure development because if the airlines aren't buying anything, buying aircraft, selling tickets, flying anywhere, increasing traffic, then obviously uh, the airports aren't getting the business and then the airports aren't spending money. So it is becoming quite a, a, a tricky area to, uh, to navigate. Um, but one shining uh, sort of star in the whole thing really is, uh, I won't say shining star, it's probably a bit, bit too harsh but one uh, more positive aspect uh, in the aerospace infrastructure sector is the defense sector i mean look um, countries are just not going to just shut up shop when it comes to the defense and there are plenty of uh, defense programs out there um, in terms of aircraft that do require orders nations need to be protected that is unlikely to change government coffers are obviously um, going to fork out money regardless um, when it comes to national security. So there are things that were ongoing before the pandemic that were going to continue. You're, you're seeing procurement programs in Belgium, uh, the Netherlands, ongoing in the UK with regards to the F-35, FCAS, Tempest um, aircraft. You're also seeing probably some things that will come through in the next few years across the world to accommodate the B-21 Raider, which is the B-2's replacement aircraft. Um, and with the numbers that are going to be procured by the US and the strategy that's probably going to be required for that aircraft, in theater across the world, you're likely going to see some sort of remote bases uh, being constructed for them the infrastructure for which it's, is anyone's guess really but it, it makes sense that you have some forward operating bases to accommodate those aircraft in tandem with that there are a number of more rudimentary things at the construction level that we're obviously going to need to change everyone has obviously got used to i won't say get used to that's probably again too strong but everyone is having to adapt to remote working and one industry that doesn't really, you know, bode well or go well with remote working is the construction industry. You need to physically be there to produce anything. And that is quite tricky. That is quite tricky to accommodate. And the construction industry itself is not... When you get down to the bare bones basics of physically installing a product or, or even digging a hole... Uh, it is not a technologically advanced activity and to get the supply chain 
to get on board with technological improvements and even revolutions is quite difficult because they are uh, not a sector that is very well accustomed to it. Now, there are exceptions to this rule, largely the main contractors, the large contractors, the likes of the you know, the Balfour Beatties, the Lang O'Rourke's, the Sisks, the BAMs, the Vinci's across the world, those kind of organizations. They'll invest in construction technology without a doubt, but it's their supply chain that are going to be the ones that need to get on board or are going to be required to get on board really to, to make themselves more efficient. Uh, and let's not forget, a lot of these large contractors are management contractors. They won't have much plant equipment labor. They will have engineers and project managers to oversee the smaller supply chains. And it is those supply chains that need to uh, begin adapting to the new reality, really. And that's where a lot of my focus is going to be, is how to adapt and help adapt the supply chain of the small and medium-sized enterprises to a technological revolution. Now, one aspect of that is obviously BIM. Now, BIM is a uh, horrendously portrayed and poorly portrayed and poorly promoted acronym, which is really going to be the future of construction and how we do it. It is mainly a set of processes and procedures in order to properly document digitally document your work as you go along and unfortunately it is it has been promoted more so in the direction of physical buildings than it has towards infrastructure development and by infrastructure development i mean large-scale civil engineering projects roads rail uh, large earthworks it doesn't doesn't sound like the type of project that requires BIM related activities but in reality it is and it is a sector that is going to have to quickly adapt to it and as we go through this pandemic and as aerospace infrastructure is very much a civils project and not a a building driven project efficiencies are going to have to be found and this is where the supply chain now is going to have to get on board with all that in order to make their product more affordable, uh, to give uh, asset owners a reason to still invest and not dish out too much cash and hopefully uh, keep keep airports and uh, their associated uh, facilities in, in tip-top order and, and, and encourage the, uh, the owners, the asset owners to, to invest and continue investment. And continuous investment has been something that is interesting to observe over the past couple of weeks, months, a few months actually, and how different nations are approaching it and different organizations. If you look at the UK, for example, infrastructure investment in the aerospace world or in airport infrastructure has all but collapsed. And the fact of the matter is quite a lot of staff have been unfortunately laid off and this is a problem, obviously. Now, if you look at uh, Europe and the European continent, uh, there are still quite a number of airports that are continuing to invest. Uh, Brussels Airport, that's Brussels National, Zaventum, has recently just completed another runway resurfacing project. Rather than cancel it or hold back on the funds, they've clearly powered ahead and realized that there is value in um, making best use of the downtime. Stuttgart was another one that's uh, continued to invest, although arguably that was already planned before the uh, pandemic started. But needless to say, they still went ahead with it and continued with it. Rennes in France is another airport. Tarbes, another airport in France, has continued investing in their infrastructure. Now, having said that, Tarbes is one of the places where all the uh, stored aircraft are being sent, so arguably their business is is in better shape but we see the in the UK very little is being done it is a very much a batten down the hatches attitude which is understandable really if you have no business coming in you really need to reduce the cash flow and it's important that 
you balance future outlook with your cash flow. So I'm not in any privileged position to know the balance sheets of any of these businesses. Nonetheless, it's clear that any infrastructure asset needs to have a long-term view taken to it. And as far as I can see at this present time, that long-term view is not being taken in the UK. Now, apart from that, the defense side is continuing to spend. There are still a number of projects in the pipeline in the UK in the defense sector. And there will be a number of aircraft coming on stream that will clearly need some infrastructure to support them. I'm sure the E7 wedge tail in Waddington, assuming Waddington will be the base that takes it, uh, will require some form of uh, base improvements, base enhancements. And um, yeah, there are a number of other little projects on the go that uh, the DIO, that's the Defence Infrastructure Organisation, will will bring on stream as time goes goes on. And uh, yeah, that's kind of um, kind of where where things are going in the in the aviation side of things. On the space side of things, that's where things are starting to get very interesting. Space is obviously an area which is going to have a long term view taken to it. It's not something that you're instantly going to see rewards um, in in you know. 12 to 24 months time unless you're a company like SpaceX or ULA where they actually have rockets going up on on a monthly basis now uh, but there is going to be a very healthy space driven economy over the next few decades and that's being seen at the moment through commercial launch activity in uh, low earth orbit you have uh, rocket labs in New Zealand you have small companies like Skyora in Scotland Virgin Orbit is another company getting things going. Firefly Aerospace, uh, and there's a, a handful of others as well that uh, don't come to mind at the moment, but they are all in the business of sending small, small rockets to low Earth orbit and uh, making money off it and and delivering small payloads to, uh, to for their customers into into low Earth orbit. Now that's obviously. Going, that is obviously requiring some infrastructure to accommodate it. If you look at Rocket Lab, they're spending money on building launch platforms in the Mahia, I think that's how you pronounce it, Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand. Um, in the UK, you got Spaceport Sutherland in Scotland, which is going through the planning application process if it hasn't already been approved. And that's for another vertical launch facility. You've also got New Key Airport, which you're hoping to attract horizontal launch capability from organizations and companies like Virgin Orbit. And in the in the US, you have a number of spaceports with uh, Florida obviously leading the way in space infrastructure and the space economy as it stands. So that area is is likely to see some growth over the next um, few few years and decades to come as we move towards building a permanent base on uh, the moon and then hopefully onwards to mars and and this is where i think the future of civil engineering is is going to be um, rather than focusing so much on the airport side of things we're going to have to we as an industry and i say we the civil engineering industry construction sector are going to have to adapt and find a way to delivering our services and products to um a lunar base or a martian base it's something that the space companies may start off doing at the beginning, but they are not construction experts. And at some point in the future, they will want to focus on their primary goal, which is to deliver equipment and, and establish uh, a base, but perhaps not to construct it and maintain it. And that's where civil engineers come in. So, yeah, civil engineering space civil engineering is is clearly something that is going to have a future in the long term and uh yeah it's going to be something that i think people need to prepare for and to go with it you're going to have to try and adapt to the technological revolutions that are going to go with it so while the construction industry may typically be considered a form of um luddite industry i say that with a bit of humor attached 
it's uh, quickly going to have to adapt if it's going to survive going to survive in its current form either that or you will see the traditional construction companies disappear and new ones being formed out of the space companies or something similar so that's my view and the state of play in the aerospace infrastructure sector at the moment uh, this is uh, obviously a, a dynamic environment we'll see how things turn out and how they pan out but for the moment enjoy it